Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, everyone. Jazakallah khair for coming today and to our session about the 10 Sahabas that were given the glad tidings of Jannah. Um, so we have already had, mashallah, five um, sessions, and today is our sixth one. We already talked about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Umar radiallahu anha, uh, anhu and uh, Umar uh, uh, Uthman bin Affan, and then um, Ali, Ali, um, Ali radiallahu anhu, and also Talha bin Ubaidullah was our last session. And today we're going to talk about Al Zubair bin Awam. And um, so, inshallah, Sister Rawan is the one who who, who uh, prepares for this session. So, inshallah, I'll give her the mic, and she will explain it to you. And after the session is finished, we will have a little bit of a discussion about the takeaway points, inshallah. So, sisters, please hold your questions for then. And um, inshallah, we'll have the discussion at the end of the class. Jazakallah khair. Sister Rawan, the mic is all yours. Jazakallah khair. Um, so we will be talking about Zubair ibn Awam, and I know that the names can, they're a little bit difficult and long, and there's so many people, but inshallah with the stories, these people kind of come back and we reference them over and over again. So inshallah, you'll, you'll get the hang of it. So let's start with Zubair. Um, so Zubair ibn Awam, radiallahu anh, the Prophet وسلم, said, every prophet has a disciple, and my disciple is Az-Zubayr. Now, this is a very noble status for Az-Zubayr ibn Awam, and there must be reasons behind this, and then we will discuss it. And another thing to note is he was best friends with Talha ibn Ubaidullah, who we talked about before, and their friendship was mostly because of the fact that they both, you know, accepted Islam through Abu Bakr Siddiq and that they, are, they were both around the same age. And he was also the Prophet Sallallahu cousin. So we'll get into that a little bit more. He was his paternal uh, cousin. And also Talha and Az-Zubayr, there's a hadith for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, Talha and Az-Zubayr are my neighbors in Jannah. So he was the cousin of the Prophet and the cousin of Ali, and he was close to his uncle Hamza. So these were all people that we know of and we're familiar with and have a, also a very high status within Islam and we have amazing legacies and what they left for us are incredible things. So he's, he has relationships with all of these people. So he is among the family of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. So Azubayr ibn Awam, he was the son of the Prophet's paternal aunt, Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib. And we'll get into who she was a little bit more. Uh, but for now, bint Abdul Muttalib, and we know Abdul Muttalib is the Prophet uh, Ali Sallam's grandpa, grandfather. So Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib is his daughter. So that makes her his aunt, the Prophet Sallam's aunt. He was the first to unsheathe his sword in the path of Allah. This was a Zubayr ibn Awam. And it's, a, it's, it's also a really, really nice story. And we will, inshallah, get into that. But it's just, you should know that. He accepted Islam at the hands of Abu Bakr, which is something very common that you'll find between the 10 people that, that were promised paradise. A lot of them were welcomed to Islam through Abu Bakr Siddiq. Uh, last week, we spoke about how Talha was his uh, Abu Bakr was from the same tribe as Talha and they were, they were second cousins and Abu Bakr sort of when he met with Talha, he told him you know, I have accepted the faith of this, like, this new faith and you should too because it's the right thing and Talha accepted Islam at the hands of Abu Bakr so a lot of the Sahaba and a lot of the ten that were promised paradise subhanAllah were guided through Abu Bakr Siddiq so it should, it should be known that Abu Bakr has a very high status because all of these great people and all of the great things that they've done for Islam, whatever they do, Abu Bakr also gets the same reward because he's the one who guided them to Islam. So this is just something that you're, you'll find common between a lot, of the, a lot of the Muslims. He was among the first people 
to accept Islam. So he was the fourth or the fifth person to accept Islam. And the reason we say fourth or fifth is because sometimes the timeline, we're just not too sure, but we know that he was among the, first, uh, the fourth or the fifth person. And when we say fourth or fifth, that's, that means he was like really up there because Khadija, Ibn Tukhwilid, the Prophet Alayhi wife, she was the first among, among the women to accept Islam. And Abu Bakr was the first among the men to accept Islam. And Ali was the first among the children to accept Islam. So that's already three people. So if he was the fourth or fifth, that means he was really, really with those people and with you know, that group of people that were among the first people to accept Islam. So it's like, it's, it's really amazing to be honest. So he married Asma bin to Abu Bakr. So uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq has uh, many daughters and one of them is Aisha and Aisha would be the wife of the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Salam. Asma was also one of the daughters of Abu Bakr and she married a Zubair. So Zubair and Abwam and Aisha were in-laws. So Aisha, his, the Prophet Aisha's wife, would be his wife's sister. So he was also not just related by blood to the Prophet Aisha, but also through, through marriage, since they both married the daughters of Abu Bakr Siddiq. His mother and his uncle. Now, this was before, this, these stories are before his mother accepted Islam. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So Az-Zubair ibn Awam, he was an orphan, which, and at the time, an or orphan um, meant if you lost your father or both your parents. So if you lose your father, you were just considered an orphan. So he grew up without a father. His father died at a very um, early on in his, very early on in his, in his life. So his mother, due to the fact that the Arabs at that time were so cruel to orphans, you know, he would get bullied and even growing up, it would be really, really hard. It's just a lot of negative stigma around being an orphan. It was just not seen as something positive and a lot of people mistreated orphans. And this is actually one of the reasons why in the Quran and the Prophet he would always say, you know, take care of the orphan, look after the orphans. And this emphasis on taking care of orphans was due to the fact of the harsh environment at the time towards orphans. So because of that, his mother did not want him to grow up humiliated and she did not want him to grow up being bullied and she didn't want him to grow up, you know, with less opportunities than other people his age. So she was really, really harsh with him and she was very strict. And the biggest thing she would teach him would be discipline and strength and character and making sure that he grew up very confident and very, very convinced with what he had and who he was as a person. So for her, it was more to build her son and to focus on her son and making him a very, very strong character so that him being an orphan had little to no effect on his life. And so she would often beat him as a form of discipline. She was just really, really strict. And can you imagine that when he accepted Islam, how much more difficult it would have been for a mother? Because at this time, these people, they were, they were shunned within society. So for her, it felt like even worse that everything that she was trying to do and he just accepted Islam and became a part of these, these people that you know no one wanted to even associate with. So she really thought, okay, like this is out of her love for him. It wasn't, toward, it wasn't the hatred of Islam that she had. It was more so the love that she had for him and her just not wanting him to suffer for anyone to belittle him. So because of that, she asked his uncle, not her brother, her paternal, his paternal uncle, she asked him to beat him and teach him. Now, this same uncle would actually tell his mother, you know, the way you discipline him is like you hate him. And obviously she was really offended by that. And she said, no, it's not because I hate him. It's because I love him. And I know how this society is and I need him to be prepared for that. But now that he's accepted Islam, 
and she's tried to convince him and she's tried to talk to him and they've argued and she's wanted him to leave, leave Islam and it hasn't worked. So she called over his uncle, her brother-in-law to basically teach him a lesson and to, to beat him and harm him until he left this new faith. And the person that actually tortured him, his name was Nofal ibn Khuwaylid. Now, this man, uh, he was Khadija ibn Khuwaylid's brother. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, his wife, her brother, he was an enemy of Islam. He tried to kill the Prophet. The Prophet actually called him the devil of Quraysh. So he was uh, an enemy and he, he fought in battles against the Prophet. He did not like Islam whatsoever. And it was Khadija's brother. So, uh, so one of Khadija's brothers were uh, Zubayr's father. So his father, Al-Awwam, Zubayr ibn Awwam, he was also one of the brothers of Khadija. So one of the brothers of uh, the Prophet Islam's wife. So there's a lot of webs here, but everyone's kind of related. So how he would torture him would be, well, at this point, he accepted Islam at the age of 12 or 13. So it was really hard. It was really easy for someone so big to easily overpower him and hurt him and harm him. And this was his uncle. He would tie him up and he would tie him up and then turn on fire right near him so that he would sort of suffocate. And a lot of parts of his skin that was near the fire would kind of burn. So, and then he would beat him and kick him and he would tell him, you know, we have to leave this faith. And subhanAllah, the personality that his mother wanted him to have, he definitely had because she trained him to have his own mind and to follow it and to not feel like, you know, you have these people and to not feel like he had to follow someone else, to always have his own mind, to have strength and character. So subhanAllah, that personality that she kind of shaped him to be was used for Islam against her and her family and his brother-in-law or her brother-in-law, and which would be his uncle, right? So he used that and he said, no, I will, I will never leave Islam. I will never go back to being um, a non-Muslim. I would just, I will always be a Muslim. He was 12 or 13 and people would walk by the house while he was sort of in the heat and suffocating and they would hear him scream. But it wasn't just screams of torture. It was screaming to emphasize the fact that he will never leave Islam. And people would hear that. And he was only at the age of 12 for... 13. So he was very young at this time. And he faced a lot of persecution just from his mother and his own uncle. So he would really, really get, get beat up. Now his, his mother, she did later on accept the slam, but it was way later on. So she wasn't really among the very, very, very first. It did take her a bit longer. Um, and and so she actually accepted Islam the day that Hamza accepted Islam, which was one of the Prophet's uncles, who was a very, very strong character. So it probably encouraged her when he accepted Islam, also because it was her brother that accepted Islam. So Hamza is her brother. So the Prophet Islam's uncle Hamza, this will, his sister would be her. I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm getting confusing, but the Prophet Islam, he has aunts and uncles. And so his aunt was the mother of Zubayr, right? So Hamza, when he accepted Islam, which would be her brother, she accepted Islam that same day. So obviously this, this never did stop Zubayr from learning, even though he was persecuted, he, he did learn about Islam. And even though he was already ridiculed for being an orphan and had lost all of his friends, except for obviously Talha and uh, Ali he, he kept them because they were also around his age and they also took Islam and they were like a trio. Um, but either way, he had a very rough childhood because of him accepting Islam. And that was the type of childhood he had. And well, not just childhood until he kind of grew up a little more as well. So he was being heavily persecuted by his mother. Now, his wife, Asma bint Abi Bakr, 
So we said that he married Abu Bakr's daughter. Now, Abu Bakr, a special thing about him is he wanted his family members and his or his daughters to marry those that were still struggling in the path of Allah and that continued to struggle in the path of Allah. He just wanted his daughters to marry pious men. It didn't matter to him if they were married to rich men, noble men. It was mostly people that he felt were noble to Allah. And he chose Zubair radiallahu anhu. Now, Asma with Abi Bakr also has her own story and she's a very significant figure within Islam as well. And inshallah, when we make another series about, you know, the women in Islam, we, she will definitely be among those names because of her strength and character and the things that she brought for Islam. And one of the most significant stories that she has would be when Abu Bakr Siddiq and the Prophet Islam, when they came to have Hijran, they came to migrate from Mecca to Medina, they they didn't want Quraysh to know. So they hid in a cave for three days and three nights. And Asma bin Abi Bakr, she would hide food. So she would she would rip um she would rip pieces of fabric and tie it around her waist so that she would carry the food all the way. So she would walk three miles, uh, so approximately three miles to her dad and the prophet, peace be upon him, and she would bring the food to them. And then she would go back. She kept going back and forth, back and forth. And it was only a few people that even know where they where they hid. And a lot of the enemies of Islam, they came to Asma bin Abi Bakr and they said, they tried to pressure her to tell her where her father was hiding or where her father and the Prophet peace be upon him, where they were hiding. And she, she didn't tell them and she denied that she even knew. And then they got so frustrated that one of them, one of the men, he, he slapped her and he slapped her so hard that her necklace fell. So, and, and honestly, that didn't stop her at all. She had kept her head held high. She was just not going to tell. So, and this is just a few, like, th these are really small stories to tell you about Asma bint Abu Bakr. But, in, but inshallah, we will have more stories uh, about her when we talk a little bit more about her. They had their, they did get married and um, they had their first son and his name was Abdullah. And he was actually the first newborn um, in, uh, in Medina for the Muslims. And it made everyone so happy that Muhammad, he picked up the child and he walked him around and they were saying takbir, so Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, you know, and they were really, really happy about having uh, that child. And he did have more children with um, Asma and uh, some other of his uh, wives after. And he named them all after warriors. So he... Some of them would be Umar ibn Khattab, Hamza, and Khalid ibn Walid. So some of the names, some of the famous warriors uh, within Islam, he named a lot of his kids after them. So um, this was the type of family that he had, and this was his wife. Now, what he was mostly known for was his courage. And he has a lot of stories um, with that, and I'm just gonna name a few. So, when we said he was the first to unsheath his sword in the name of Islam, he was actually 12 years old. And it was, it's actually a very cute and funny story. The Prophet Islam was sitting and all of a sudden this 12 year old boy is rushing and panting and he comes with the sword and he turns and he sees the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him. And the Prophet looks at him and he says, what's wrong? Why are you running? What's like, why do you have a sword in your hand? And he said, I was told that you were being attacked. And, and he said, no, I'm not being attacked, but what would you have done if I was being attacked? So he said, I would have, I would have beat him with the sword. And he was 12 or 13. So Allah, pray, um, sorry, Rasulullah prayed for him that day. And it was, and he was the first person to like actually unsheath um, his sword. And he was only 12. Now, because of his persecution and, you know, constant torturing from his mother and his uncle, the first migration of the Muslims when they migrated to Abyssinia, he was among those that mi migrated. At this time, he was not married yet, so he was not married to Asma just yet. Asma ibn Abu Bakr. He wasn't married to her just yet, so everyone else, when they migrated to Abyssinia, a lot of the Muslims, or they would usually go in as couples, so most of them were married, but he went as an individual. And so when they went and then one of the kings of Abyssinia accepted Islam, he developed a personal relationship with him 
by teaching him Islam. And he had a lot of time because he was an individual. He didn't come as a, uh, with his wife. He, he wasn't married. So he went with him and they became close friends and he taught him Islam and he, um, he, he became sort of his tiny, like his personal scholar, you could say. And he was really loyal to the king. And so a lot of people really wanted to go against the king because a lot of them were outraged by the fact that their king accepted Islam, but a lot of them accepted Islam along with their king. So this caused sort of a rebellion in, in Abyssinia between two armies. And so the king, knowing, uh, knowing as Zubayr and having you know, a personal friendship with Zubayr ibn Awam, he told him, can you swim through the Nile and see where the battle is taking place and tell us who's winning. So we have an idea, you know, so that they can either escape or, you know, something. So he was really, really fit and he could swim. So he swam, he was like, you can imagine how fit he is because he swam through the Nile to, to check on the battle. He checked on it and then swam back. So he's really great. First of all, that's just insane that you have to have an enormous amount of courage just to jump in and swim to check on a battle. That it's just really crazy. And then he came back and he obviously told them the news that no, the, the Muslims were winning the battle. So he was really, really courageous. And he got that courage from his uncle Hamza and his cousin Ali. We talked about Ali and Ali being a warrior and Ali being one of the best warriors uh, there is. And Ali would be his cousin, but also his best friend or one of his closest friends because they were also close in age. And he was really close to his uncle Hamza. And he also accepted Islam and was also very courageous. So this is a common theme within the family. Ali actually described him to have the burst of a tiger and the jump of a lion. So this is the best um, translation that I could find. So the burst of a tiger, it's just like how a tiger is just ferocious sometimes and like when they're really there. So he had, when he was in the battle, he had really good attributes. So combining the attributes of a lion and a tiger. He was described as someone that was tall, someone that was lean, someone who was muscular. He was actually described like Omar. Uh, if you remember, we did talk about Omar Khattab, him being a very, very strong character. And he was also very tall and big. He was described like Omar and that when he rode an animal, his feet would almost touch the ground. So when they rode horses, their, their legs were really, really long and, and big and muscular. So he was described like, like Omar in that sense. And it was said that when he fought, he fought with two swords. And because of his strong legs, he would direct the horse with his legs. And only one other person within Islam was known to do that. And that was Khalid ibn Walid. Um, but either way, he was very, very strong in battle. But it was incredible courage because it wasn't just strength. He would sometimes just charge in, even if there was a lot of enemies around him. And one of those incidents was the Battle of Badr. If you remember the Battle of Badr, and I'll just recap the Battle of Badr. The Battle of Badr was one of the the first large battle within Islam. And the Muslims were very, very outnumbered. Um, they actually only had two horsemen. So the Muslims only had two horsemen. And one of those horsemen was Az-Zubayr. So Az-Zubayr ibn Awam was one of those horsemen, horsemen. And even though the Muslims were outnumbered and Az-Zubayr didn't really have much armor. In fact, he kind of just fought wearing this yellow turban. Some people say it's red but it was a yellow turban that he would tie on his head and he would fight with, that, fight with that. And he was just not as well equipped as those people. He would just charge in with his horse and fight with the, both swords. So both swords in his hand while kind of controlling the horse and guiding the horse with his legs and the strength of his legs, he would fight the, he would fight the, fight the people in battle. Now he fought, so fiercely and so brave, bravely because he just would charge and it didn't matter if there was anyone next to him or anyone helping him it just he just went in um and that was sort of the personality again that his mom really wanted him to have and we know that in the battle of Badr, uh, because the muslims were so outnumbered and it was one of the first major battles that the angels were among those that fought alongside 
the Muslims. So there would be angels with them, assisting the Muslims with, with, with fighting. And subhanAllah, because of Zubair's fierceness and Zubair's courage, um, Rasulullah the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said, Jibreel and the angels that were with him were fighting with yellow turbans, like Zubair. So they were, they were imitating Zubair of Awam. They were dressed like Zubair when fighting. And that's, a, that's just an honor for, for Zubair for the angels themselves to come and to imitate you in battle is, is incredible. So they were all wearing a yellow turban just as he was wearing a yellow turban. That's such an honor. And in that battle, he did suffer many wounds because again, the Muslims were really outnumbered. So if you, were, if you were one, you were fighting a lot of people. So you just had to be really, really strong and it didn't matter how many wounds you had. You just kind of had to keep fighting. And he did suffer so many wounds. And even though that didn't stop him or slow him down or anything like that, they were still very severe and permanent. In fact, his son uh, said, you know, he used to he used to put his fingers through some of the holes that were caused by those injuries when he was younger. And so he would kind of play with play with his injuries. So he would remember how severe those those holes that were caused during that battle. Now, in another battle, there was a, a duel. So a lot of the battles, they would begin with duels. So basically, the best fighters would kind of be brought forth, and that would kind of start the battle. And that's how they would start the battle. Wouldn't They wouldn't just charge. It would be more so whoever it was would say, OK, well, this is my best fighter. Bring out yours. And they have a duel. And this sort of dictates the morale and the theme of the, the battle and how it would be. So one of the men that were in one of the duels, he came out and, you know, he said, who will fight me? And he had the best horse in, in the entire, both armies. So both armies, his horse was actually the best horse and the strongest horse. And he was actually one of their best warriors. So that's why he was chosen to take part in the duel. Because they knew that, you know, not a lot of people would want to fight fight this man having the best horse because he would fight on a horse and also having such great armor um, on, uh, on the battlefield. So <sighs> Zubayr was like, when uh, the prophet said, okay, well, who will, who will choose to fight? Who will choose to duel? And Zubayr and Awan said, I will do it. And the prophet Asam gave him permission. And his mother was so scared for him. And she expressed that to the prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she said, no, he's, he's going to kill my son. And the Prophet Sam said, no, inshallah, a Zubayr will actually kill him. And Talha, within actually a few minutes, well, Talha was not on a horse. So you have to know that Talha was not on a horse. This man was on a horse and he was one of their greatest warriors. He had the best horse, he had armor, he had a sword. He already was at an advantage. But within a few minutes, a Zubayr disarmed him, knocked him off his horse, took his sword, got back, got mounted his horse, and then killed him with his own sword on his own horse. And then brought the horse back to the Muslims. So you could imagine not just the courage, but it's just, it's just incredible because now the, the strongest horse, the best horse in the army did not only belong to a Zubayr now, but it belonged to the Muslims. So this really set a theme for, for, for the battle and really high morale. For, for the Muslims. Um, another one is during the Battle of Uhud. Now we, we talked about the, the Battle of Uhud when we were talking about Talha, when we said this was Talha's day. And um, because he, he stayed with the Prophet and he protected the Prophet and he got more than 73 wounds protecting the Prophet. This was Talha who we talked about last week. And we had a map of the, the, the Battle of Uhud to show you sort of how things happened within Uhud and how, you know, a lot of the, so I'll, I'll give a short recap. There were two sides kind of. So one side was protected. It was all around mountains. So behind the Muslims, there were mountains. So they knew that the, they knew that the enemies of Quraysh, they couldn't come through those mountains. They could only come through two passageways. And one passageway was the army and the other passageway, we had 
they had set archers. And then when the Muslims saw that, or when the archers saw that the Muslims were sort of winning the battle, they really wanted to collect the rewards of the battle. So they kind of came down and they said, okay, well, we're winning anyway. And most of the archers went down and there were only a few left. So then the enemy saw that the second passageway, because there was only two passageways, the second passageway was free. So they were able to kind of change the entire uh, course of the battle and the tables completely turned. So they came from behind the Muslims and then the Muslims uh, began to lose battle when they were winning the battle. They, uh, they didn't ultimately lose. It was more so they, they sat back and then they charged a few of their warriors and then the battle kind of ended with a lot of losses, but the, uh, the enemies kind of left and they, they left the battle. So it kind of ended on that note where a lot of lives were lost and a lot of people had surrendered and turned back and, and, and ran away. So the, that was during the Battle of Uhud and Zubayr ibn Awam, Abu Bakr, Talha, and those who stayed with the Prophet there was an ayah in the Quran that was sent about these people while other people retreated because as Zubayr still charged through and uh, to make sure that the prophet was safe, he had to charge through the people and make sure that he, he, he made sure that he was causing them a bit of trouble so that they wouldn't come forth and harm the prophet more than they already had because the prophet already had a lot of wounds at this time. And we know from the past story that when we talked about Talha that Talha was with the Prophet as well, and he was protecting him and a lot of people. There were a lot of losses that happened. And so we know that those who participated in the Battle of Ahd and those who retreated, they were forgiven by Allah and the Prophet ﷺ. So all is good. But those who did stay still have, you know, a special reward and a special rank with, uh, with Allah and the Prophet. ﷺ. And the ayah is from Al Umran, uh, Ayah 172. I'll just read it and then translate. For the Billahi Minash Tanjim, Aladina Stajabu Lillahi Wal Rasul Min Badima Asabahum Al Karahu, Liladina Ahsan Minhum, Wattaku Ajun Alim. Those believers who responded to Allah and the Messenger after injury had struck them. Uh, for those who did good among them and feared Allah is a great reward. So this ayah came down for these people. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she was talking to Azubair's son. And she said, uh, Aisha would be Azubair's, aunt, Azubair's son's aunt, obviously, because he married um, Asma bint Abu Bakr, which would be Aisha's sister. So uh, Aisha is this little boy's aunt. And she was talking to him and she was saying, you know, the, you know this ayah? This ayah is about your, your grandfather, which would be Abu Bakr. And she said, it's also about your father, Az-Zubayr. Az-Zubayr ibn Awam. And so what you kind of take from this is that an ayah was sent down as for these people. So in one of the battles, the angels came down with yellow turbans imitating him. And then in another battle, an, an ayah was sent down for these people and they are known. And one of them would be as Zubayr. So you think how much more honor can you have, but it's, it just keeps going because these people just never stopped. Uh, SubhanAllah. And his son, the one that Aisha was talking to, as Zubayr ibn Awam's son, he actually became uh, a scholar and he's actually known for giving so much for the, the Prophet, peace be upon him, his biography. So his lineage and his family, if you, if you look more into it, it could be confusing now because there's a lot of names and people, oh, this aunt and this uncle and this person's brother and this. So it's a lot, it's very confusing and it's, it's definitely a very confusing family tree if you're not too familiar with the names. But what you have to know is that his family in general and even the family that he married into and his cousins, these people, they were good people and had an, a house that was full of not just courage, but also knowledge. Because even when he was being persecuted, he was still learning. And he was, he was still learning about uh, Islam with the Prophet, peace be upon him. And even though he's being persecuted and he had to migrate, he still acted as a scholar in Abyssinia to teach the king more about Islam. 
And his own son became someone that was really, really in charge of the biography of the Prophet ﷺ and gave us a lot of information. So this is Zubair's is, is, uh, is family. That's how his family was. And that was kind of the theme of the family. It wasn't just about courage and fighting and war. It was also about knowledge and spreading knowledge and learning and giving a lot to the Ummah. And I think no matter how much we say, we'll just not be enough and it will never do them justice because these are all summaries of their stories, but who they were as people was just so much more than their stories. Um, now, the way he passed away was also very sad. So I'll give you a recap, first of all, to Uthman ibn Affan's story who we talked about in the past. If you don't remember, I'll just give you a quick recap because it's definitely relevant. Uthman ibn Affan was the third Khalifa in Islam and the Khalifa would be the person that's in charge of the Ummah after the Prophet, peace be upon him, dies. So after, uh, after Rasulullah passed away, Abu Bakr Siddiq came after him and ruled for a few years. And then after Abu Bakr passed away, Umar ibn Khattab was the next Khalifa. And Umar ibn Khattab actually appointed um, people for voting. And uh, he picked, you know, the most noble people and great people. And one of those people was Zubair ibn Awam. And another one, I believe, was Talha as well. So what's important here is Zubair ibn Awam was one of those people that Umar ibn Khattab appointed because Umar Khattab trusted him so much with the decisions of the, of the Ummah. So it was kind of a, a majlis. And what this basically means is, is the people that were in charge of meeting rooms and voting and stuff like that, just the affairs of, of, the, of the people of Islam at the time. And so Zubair ibn Awam was one of those people that were appointed during Umar Khattab's reign. Now, after Umar Khattab passed away, there came Uthman ibn Affan, that was the third Khalifa. But if you remember, there was something that happened where a lot of people said, no, Ali should have been the third Khalifa. Why, why did people vote Uthman? What, what's going on? Why did this happen? And then a lot of rumors spread about Uthman and they sieged his house for 40 days and they, they didn't let him eat and they starved him and they didn't allow him to pray. And then at the end of it, they murdered him in his own home. So if you remember that that was Uthman's story and that's what happened during the reign of Uthman. So Zubair ibn Awam was actually one of those people that didn't even vote for Uthman. He voted for Ali because that was just the way he thought. And also they were really, really close. Again, I mentioned as Zubair and Talha and Ali were like a trio, they were friends. So Talha, the person that we talked about in the past, uh, last week and then the week before that when we spoke about Ali, these people were all friends and were also around the same age. So he actually voted for Ali, but Uthman bin Affan won the vote and he, he, he pledged for um, Uthman bin Affan and that was fine. So during Uthman bin Affan's reign, when the people were trying to kill him and trying to murder him, Zubair bin Awam was one of those people that wanted to defend him and that wanted to fight against these people that were fighting Uthman and that were trying to kill him and that were trying to murder him and assassinate him. He was one of those people that were really, really against that. And he sent his kids to fight on a uh, fight for him and on his behalf. And he sent them and he said, you know, he wanted to form uh, an, an, an army to fight. And he told Uthman bin Affan, he told him, he said, let me fight. Let us fight. Let us, you know, remove these people that are trying to kill you and that are trying to cause strife. Let's just, let us defend you. But he said, no. And Uthman said, I don't want any blood being spilled between the Muslims. I just don't want that to happen. So you, you will let down and not draw, your, not draw your swords and you will stop this. And we're not fighting. We are not going to spread any blood, um, spill any blood between the Muslims. And Zubair ibn Awam was really frustrated by this. And it was, it was really frustrating for a lot of the Muslims that wanted to, to defend Uthman ibn Affan. And then when he died and when he passed away, if you remember when we were talking about Ali because he came after Uthman and a lot of things happened because people were telling him, you know what, we want revenge for Uthman and now you are the next Khalifa because Ali came after Uthman and they were saying, you're the next Khalifa. So let us, um, let us get revenge for Uthman ibn Affan. He was, he was murdered. Let us get revenge for him. And Ali would say, I, I, will, I will, I will get them and I will, I will chase down the murderers and we'll, um, you know, we will deal with them, we will punish them. But right now I need to, 
I have an, I need to be organized. I need to have things that are settled. I, I, I will, I will do that, but not now. And there were a lot of people that were, that didn't want that to happen. They said, no, we will not pledge allegiance to you until Uthman and Affan, until we see justice has been served for Uthman and Affan. And one of those people was a Zubair ibn Awam. So there were a lot of Sahaba actually, and among them was also Talha. Talha, who we talked about last week, who said who, who was also among those people that said, no, we want, we want revenge for Uthman now. And we will not pledge allegiance until we find those murders. Because obviously this is very frustrating to, to grow up with people and to fight with them and to, to be persecuted and to be tortured with them and to witness all of these amazing things about these people and to witness hardships and to be just to be a part of these people's lives. It was not easy for them to just to be murdered and to be murdered in cold blood after the Prophet Ali Islam passed away. This was very hard for them to, to accept because they knew that they knew each other and on a very, very, very personal level. So this was the type of frustration that was among the Muslims after Uthman ibn Affan died. And this was during Ali radiallahu anhu's reign. So there was Talha ibn Ubaidullah who was best friends with the Zubair ibn Awam. And they all went and they were like, you know what, we, we will pledge to you, but we just need revenge. And so, and we need these people to be punished. And this obviously caused a lot of strife between the Muslims because now you had two sides, people saying, you know what, no, let's just be Ali. And then these people are like, no, not now. And obviously this, this led to war eventually, right? And they did form battles, but how the war actually happened was not just, you know, the, the Muslims fought each other, no. Before that, and this is very important because this is how he passed away. So before that, they, as Zubair and Awam and Talha and Ali, and Aisha, radiallahu anha, who was also who also wanted uh, vengeance for Uthman ibn Affan, they, when the tents were already set for battle, but before the fight, so this was the night before, or a little bit before, around like the e evening, not really, it's not dark out yet. So they met up together in a tent and they discussed it. And Ali anhu was discussing with them and, and they were they were reckon like it was there was reconciliation about to about to happen right at this point so they were discussing things and Ali anhu said and he referred to a story when a Zubair was sitting next to next to him he said yeah Zubair do you remember when we were sitting together and you know things were good and you know we were like we were brothers do you remember when the prophet Islam saw us sitting together and he said to us, Ya Zubair, oh Zubair, do you love Ali? And Zubair said, yes. And he said, well, one day you will fight against him and you will be in the wrong. And at this point, Zubair was just like, this is impossible. This guy's, this is my brother. What could possibly make me ever want to fight against him, right? And this obviously happened years ago. So when they were sitting in that tent discussing, you know, the fight and the battle, and, you know, they were trying to just not get involved and not to fight. Ali al reminded Zubair of that story. And he said, do you remember when the Prophet said that? And Zubair said, yes, I remember. So he, he completely just didn't want to be a part of this anymore. And he said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm retreating. I'm, I'm done. I'm not, I'm not going to fight. And the fighting didn't really start yet at this point. How it started was there were a few people, a few people that just loved evil for some reason, attacked both tents of both sides of, um, of both sides. And they, so each side thought the other side was the one that attacked first. So that kind of was what initiated the battle between the Muslims. It wasn't the fact that they actually went through with the battle. It was the fact that they were attacked in the middle of the night and thought that it was the other side. So they sought defense and that's why they, they fought. And that is why they fought with each other. So the Muslims were not initially, so the battle was not initially supposed to happen. They already sort of reconciled in the tent that day when Ali radiallahu reminded Zubayr ibn Awam about, you know, him, you will one day go against me, that you will be in the wrong, and that he was reminded, and that everyone sort of had a, a great reminder, and it was a good discussion. And Zubayr ibn Awam backed down, and he said, okay, then I'm, I'm leaving. And at this point, so this was before the battle happened, before anyone attacked either of the tents, 
while he was walking away, one of the people, one of the men said, uh, I want to, I want to accompany you. I want to walk with you. And he said, who are you? And he said, well, I'm this and this, and I just want to accompany you. And he did accompany him. He did accompany Zubair and Awam. And as they were walking, um, it was it was prayer time and they came to pray. And the other man that was accompanying Zubair, he did the iqama. So he said, Ashhadu an Allah, Rasulullah. Uh, you know, the whole iqama for, for starting the prayer. And then Zubayr started the prayer. When he said, Allahu Akbar, and started the prayer, that man grabbed a knife and stabbed him and consist, like constantly stabbing him from the side until he passed away. So he passed away in prayer. And it, it's, it's really upsetting because he was walking away from the battle. You, it was just so un, unnecessary. There was no fight. There was no self-defense. There was just assassination that was going on here. And this man, he, he stabbed him several times until he passed away. And this was a great loss for the Muslims. And SubhanAllah, you will find that this is a common theme among a lot of the Sahaba. A lot of them were murdered in prayer. Uh, when they tried killing uh, Ali, they, they tried killing him in prayer. Um, or, and we talked about someone previously who did actually die in prayer because he was killed in prayer as well so a lot of the muslims umar khattab was he, he died in prayer as well they were all murdered in prayer because these people they are strong men and they knew that if they faced them face to face that they would they would lose so if he actually tried fighting a zubayr ibn awam you know you're fighting a really really great warrior that's really really fast and is used to fighting but the thing is these people were cowards they waited for them to start their prayer so that they can hurt them and harm them and this man, he stabbed him and he killed him and he took his sword. He took a Zubayr ibn Awam's sword and he went back to Adi thinking that Adi would be happy that he killed a Zubayr ibn Awam. So he went and he said, and, and Ali didn't want to talk to anybody at this time. It was, it was in his tent and he went to the guards and he said, I want to talk to Ali. And they said, no, uh, Ali's not talking to anybody right now. And he said, no, I want to talk to him. And they said, no. And then what happened was he said, okay, we'll give him this. And that was the sword of the Zubayr ibn Awam after he assassinated him unjustly in, in the Zubayr's prayer. And he handed him the sword and they took the sword and they showed it to Ali and they brought it in. And Ali, he began to weep loudly. And the man outside the, outside the tent, he was expecting him to cheer, expecting, to, expecting him to be happy that he killed the Zubayr ibn Awam and that, that's his sword on the table. That the great warrior that was going to fight on the other side you know, now he's dead and I brought you his sword. He was expecting him to cheer. He was expecting him to be happy. And Ali al who he looked at the sword and he, he wept and he began to cry and he was upset. And he said, and he said, you know what? I heard the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, when you meet the killer of the son of Safiya, Safiya is, is a Zubair Muhawam's mother's name. And he said, when you meet, I heard the Prophet Sallallahu say, when you meet the killer of the son of Safiya, give him the news of hellfire. And he kept repeating that while he was weeping. And he kept wiping his tears and he was weeping. And he said, whoever killed him, then give him the news that he will be in hell. Whoever killed the son of Safiya, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, whoever kills him, then give him the news that he is in hell. And when Ali al darian wiped his tears and came outside to meet the killer, he ran. He ran away and, and he heard this and he heard that he was going to be among those of the, of the hellfire and he, and he heard that and he was, he committed suicide. He ran away from Ali Ghaliran and he, he killed himself. And that's the story of Azubir Nawam and how he passed and how the killer um, killed himself. And so the, the killer, his name is Amr ibn al Jarmus, and that's the man that committed suicide after killing a Zubayr ibn Awam, thinking that Ali will be happy with this death. But of course, Ali was not, and he wept, and the Muslims came and they, and they prayed Janaza for, for a Zubayr ibn Awam. And this was very, very sad for the Muslims because a Zubayr ibn Awam was lost that day. And then when both camps of, the, of both sides of the Muslims were attacked, and each other in, in each of each of the sides of the battle fought that the other side attacked them and, the, and a battle arose. And as you know, from last week, Talha was shot with an arrow during that battle, even though Talha, he faced Ali and Ali, he reminded him of something and Talha drew down his weapons and walked away. So Ali did not want to kill these people. 
it, it was none of them actually wanted to kill each other. It was just a battle that arose because they thought that the other side had attacked. But a lot of them, when reminded of Allah, when reminded of the Prophet, they they walked away. They 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 retreated. They did not want to be part of these things anymore. But of course, there will always be people that love strife among the Muslims. There's always going to be people that are treacherous and they shot Talha with an arrow. And another example is now when Zubair and Awam walked away and someone followed him while he was praying and then killed him and then brought the sword to Ali. But obviously Ali was not happy about it and they prayed Janaza. And a lot of the Sahaba were really upset and they wept because these people, they were like brothers. They grew up with each other, you know, especially Zubair and Talha and Ali. They were, they were a trio. They were inseparable from each other due to their closeness and age and how early on they accepted Islam. And a common theme in Zubayr's family is all his sons actually passed away in prayer as well. So subhanAllah, it is very sad, but at the same time, they, their ranks are very high, you know, to pass away while worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, it's, 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 it's a great honor at the same time, but it's, it's a loss for the Muslims. And so this is the story of Zubair ibn Awam, and I, I hope that it was well understood, inshallah. If you have anything to discuss, this is, this is the time. If you have questions, if you have comments, if you want to share what resonated with you, you can, you can definitely go ahead and do that now. Jazakallah khair, Kathiran. Sister Rawan, that was a, mashallah, very detailed story. And uh, yeah, you touched up on the other um, other sahabas too, in a very sad part of the Muslim Ummah when it happened. It was mostly done by hypocrites. They would uh, they would be the one who would cause um, you know they wanted the Muslims to become weak, and this is how they did. Like they would say things and do things, and even throw arrows. Um, go on the other side and throw arrow, and then come back on this side and throw arrows, just to cause them to fight. They just this is how hypocrites do. And that's why there is such a long discussion of hypocrites um, in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, right in the beginning of the Quran. Um, it's like 20 verses, 20 or 22 verses that Allah just describes the hypocrites that we have to be very careful um, how hypocrites can, you know, infiltrate inside the Muslim Ummah and cause us to fight among ourselves. Um, yeah. And they are constantly doing it, even now also. So, you know, we have to be very careful that I heard and she said and he said, we shouldn't do that. We should, you know, be 100% sure uh, what we see ourselves. And then, and Prophet warned them all. They all had the warnings, but, you know, still it happened to them. And uh, there's uh, wisdom in it. But anyway, it's, uh, it's a long discussion to that. But yeah, amazing life about... Uh, uh, the Sahaba uh, Zubair bin uh, Awam um, Subhanallah So what are the some of the takeaway points that uh, Sister Namira, Sister Pearl Sister Priya uh, if you have anything uh, that you uh, that stood out for you and that something that you know um, that really touched your heart if you want to share um so, you know, we all should, these are all uh, done so that we can improve ourselves um, and, you know, learn learn from them and how we can apply in our lives, inshallah. Um, so any anything that you would like to share, please either just unmute yourself and say it or raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Or, or if you have any questions too, like Sister Rawan said. MashaAllah, she presented it very nicely. Any comments, any questions? If anyone would, sorry. So go ahead, go ahead. Sister Priya, right. Priya has her hand up. Oh, okay, Sister Priya, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, Sister, I don't have any doubts. Uh, so this is my first time listening to Sahaba, like the companions of Prophet. Uh, so this is this is really good. Thank you, Sister Jazakallah Khair. 
and it, the thing inspired me is about you know at the age of 12 or something you mentioned he yeah. went before the prophet and uh, said like who attacked you and just took out the sword that bravery and the love for you know the for prophet and god that that inspired me a lot like at the age of 12 oh my god that today you know the youngsters they are with mobile and with the social media and stuff but how people are there when you know in the prophet's time it was too touching and when he died he was in prayer and in sujood like that's a blessing it, it really touched my heart thank you sister for that yeah that's so true mashallah sister sister priya yeah sister um, ravan uh, presented it very nicely yeah um, yeah it is true that he he was so young and he was tortured so much and um but i remember reading about him that he was a very um, rough like you know very strong personality i guess all the torture that he suffered in a, such a young age uh, made him very um you know like a very strong and rough and um i, I remember um the a story about how asma his wife once complained that you know he's just too rough like you know he's very very he was a strong minded person right he'd gone through so much but uh, uh prophet was uh, told her that just hang on to him because he's he's one of the person who will lead you to jannah because you know he's already given the glad tidings and i i guess he didn't have a, you know how women we need soft side because he had gone through so much at such a young age he just was very strong natured and um so yeah that so and then of course asma did stay, <laughs> stick with him but you know as women we want that soft man sometimes who is you know romantic at times i guess he wasn't or whatever reason i i didn't go in deep in that but this is how he was subhanallah and yeah to die in prayer and then how sister ravan said that so many of sahabas died in prayer and then all his sons also my goodness i can um, you know we see some, once in a while in a youtube video somebody a imam is leading a prayer and then he had a heart attack or something and we think mashallah he's so lucky but look how many sahabas died i didn't even know like i i knew about umar and a few other but i never knew that zubair bin awan also died uh, in yeah. prayer yeah it is something to uh, a nice point to realize that you know how close yeah. they were to allah <laughs> Yes, subhanallah and they were usually assassinated in prayer because uh, the hypocrites they a lot of them couldn't face the muslims themselves they were too scared because the people that they were assassinated assassinating were usually strong characters and tough people that they couldn't face so they would just they found that their most vulnerable yeah. points were were during prayer subhanallah so so that's like what the concentration was so good subhanallah like remember i remember a story of ali that he got hurt and they had to take out the arrow and uh, it was very deep and they said you know um, maybe we should um, it'll be very difficult so he said don't worry when I, i'll start praying and then when you do it i won't even feel it like what kind of a prayers did they have and they did do it like yeah once he said allah akbar they took out the arrow and he didn't even wince like you know he didn't even It didn't hurt him at all because he his concentration of facing Allah was so good that it didn't affect him. Yeah. I don't know how what kind like I cannot even imagine. Inshallah, may Allah give us that kind of a khushu in our prayer that once we face Allah for us the rest of the world is gone. Yeah. But one phone ring, one fly <laughs> comes and we get disturbed and our whole concentration is gone. We don't even know what we prayed and how many sajdas we did. um but their prayer was amazing like you know amazing khushu amazing connection with allah may allah make us have this kind of a connection that the sahabas that we talk about on a weekly basis had like they were, they were so close to allah their belief and their connection with allah was so good subhanallah any comment by you sister pearl or sister namira i know you're busy having breakfast with your husband so we won't disturb you But Sister Pearl, do you have any comment that you want to share? I know you are in pain too. Sister Pearl had uh, some tooth surgery done, so she is in a lot of pain. So if you don't want to talk, I I will totally understand. Yes, because I have to get Advil 
soon because I don't have any in my bottle and it's just like they took out the three teeth. They I know, I know. I'm whiskey. sorry. I completely forgot about the ad. Well, okay, inshallah soon. Inshallah, but did yeah. you learn anything today that you would like to share? I just got uh, on afterwards because my the internet was not working. Oh, so, okay, okay. Yeah, so but I will, right? I will rewatch the um the video, inshallah. Okay, yeah. inshallah. Sure, sure, Sister Pearl. Sorry about that. May Allah make your pain go, elevate your, uh, you know, your uh, station with Allah. Whenever we go through any pain, Allah forgives loss of our sins and we get our 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 station raised. So inshallah, Allah will do that for you. Um, if anyone Sister has, Pearl. sorry, I'm so sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Sister Ramani. Um, If anyone has questions about, um, you know, how the family thing worked or brothers-in-law, sister-in-laws, if you found any of that confusing, I can re-explain. If I mentioned battles that you're not too familiar with, um, you could also, you know, say, I could repeat that. Um, I could even pull up the map from before and discuss that. Yeah, Priya. Um, sister, sorry for this. I just forgot why uh, he got, you know, assassinated. The reason. So um, why he got assassinated was there were two sides, people that were with Ali saying that, OK, let's pledge allegiance to Ali right now and he will avenge Uthman's death. And then the other side was saying, before we pledge to you, you need to avenge Uthman's death. And Zubair ibn Awam was among those people with Talha and with Aisha as well, the wife of the prophet. They were all together and a lot of the Sahaba said, no, we won't pledge just yet until, um, until you uh, find Uthman's, uh, Uthman's killers. So because Zubair was on the other side and they had the discussion where in the camp where they reconciled and they said, you know, do you remember what the Prophet said about me? And Zubair Rawam remembered and he, he was like, okay, I'm not going to be a part of this anymore. And one of the people that did pledge allegiance to, to Ali, but there were also someone that that just didn't understand that the, the love that the Muslims had for each other and how spilling blood between Muslims is never a good thing. One of the hypocrites, he, he killed a Zubair ibn Awam thinking that he killed someone from the other side or a powerful warrior from the other army. So that was the reason of his death, that this man wanted to bring the sword to Ali and say, oh, I killed one of your enemies, which was a person that didn't pledge allegiance to you right now. Do you, do, do you understand? Uh, yes, sister. Thank you. It's more like a civil war, right? Sorry? Uh, it's more like a civil war between them. Yes. Yeah. It was like a civil war. Exactly. It was literally a civil, civil war, actually. But the mm -hmm. battle was never supposed to take place. Like it was prepared. The camps were there, but it never was supposed to take place because they sat together in the camp and they came to an agreement that they will they would pledge allegiance to Ali. And then later he can he can avenge uh, Uthman. So they did come to an agreement in the tent, but when they went back to the tents, um, the hypocrites attacked both sides to make it seem like the other side attacked first. And that's what sparked the war, but it was never supposed to actually happen. These people, they loved each other and they didn't want it to happen. So it was kind of a civil war that happened and, and a lot of the people were assassinated, especially people that didn't want to take part. And Azubayr ibn Awam was one of those people that didn't want to take part anymore and he was assassinated. So that's that's what it was. Uh, thank you for explaining, sister. That's intense. For, for sure. Yeah, for sure. If anyone else didn't understand anything else, go ahead, ask. Okay, if there's no questions, then maybe you should um, end the recording so it won't be too, too long. Okay, sure. Jazakallah. I'll just finish the class and then I'll stop. Um, Jazakallah khair, everybody, for attending. Uh, the session inshallah we will end and we'll meet next week uh, and we'll have another very eye-opening or <laughs> informative session inshallah uh, so let me just read the dua auzu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim wal asr inna al-insana lafi khus illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawassaw bil haqq wa tawassaw bis sabr subhanaka allahumma bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone.